We have a lot of, uh, of uh, logistics to go over today, you guys. But I um, wanted to start, so we'll get to a bunch of things uh, uh, in a bit. But I wanted to start with a couple things. We're going to go over some basic stuff um, uh, in grading your, some of you guys' lab write-ups. I think we need to go back over some, some basic stuff. Um, and then, uh, then I want to talk about our, our main nut of our paper, of, of, our, of our, we're not doing a paper, we're doing a poster, but, but our species assessment for this semester. We'll get going on that, and then we'll deal with a bunch of logistics and stuff too. So we'll get to all that today. I want to start today with talking about, um, just a refresher here, so this is probably nothing new to folks, but it may be we've forgotten some of it or we haven't, we haven't uh, been paying super close attention in the last few classes, so I just want to make sure we're all on the same page with this. So interrupt me, ask questions if anything here isn't making sense. Cool? Okay. I just want to go over, uh, when we're doing our lab write-ups and we're looking at things this, this class, um, you know, we want to... Um, one of our key skills is we want to be able to interpret information, right? Generate information, present information in a, in a technical manner, rigorous manner, that kind of good stuff. And so, um, so I want to talk about that, how, how we go about doing that. Um, one of the things we use, uh, a, a key tool of our trade, is this whole idea, the field of statistics and, and data visualization. And essentially what statistics are is essentially being powerful, right? That's what science is. Science is essentially predicting the future. That, that's all we do with science, right? We, have a hypo we think we understand how these things work together, and then once we understand the principles, the system, the interactions, then we can look at a new, a new instance and predict what's gonna happen. Oh, if I give the person this drug, that's gonna make the cancer go away. If I give food to this critter, it's gonna grow at this, you know, add this many pounds per, per month or whatever the heck, right? So that's fundamentally what we're doing. Statistics is one of our key tools to make sure that what we're seeing is real. And that's because our world that we work in is very noisy. Much more noisy than just about any other system we can pick, right? So, you know, we have fantastic friends in chemistry, fantastic friends in physics and all those great places and stuff. But those worlds are much more, uh, much less noisy on average than our, than our ecological systems. Our ecological systems, very noisy, very hard to figure out what's going on. So statistics is really particularly important. The noisier, the more chaotic it seems, the more harder it is to discern patterns, we need to really be able to understand these, these tools. Now, this is not a statistics class, right? We're not gonna spend the whole time talking about different uh, how to calculate different statistical tests, but you need to understand the fundamentals. And so, just briefly, a few aspects of those fundamentals I wanted to touch on now. And so statistics is giving us the power to evaluate the world, right? And so here's a, here's a quote uh, from uh, uh, CNN a few years ago, and, it, and uh, the host says, my next guest tonight is making some remarkable assertions about the causes of our recent violent weather. He says we face the man-made threat of terrorist hurricanes. He says Katrina, Hurricane Katrina, for example, was created by the Japanese, Japanese mafia using Russian-made technology, right? That's all complete baloney, right? That your baloney detector should have totally been going off, right? Um, all aspects of these can be evaluated, can be evaluated rigorously. And when we apply something like statistics, it shows that yes, no, Hurricanes maybe are getting crazier or stronger. It's not because of some weird conspiracy person or some mafia guy stuck somewhere or whatever. Um, so statistic, so what a, what's a statistic? A statistic is something where we say, um, okay, given the information, so, so let's say we, we'll use the analogy of a bag of marbles in my hand grabbing, grabbing marbles out of the bag, right? And so statistics says, hey, I've grabbed something. I've sampled some of those marbles, right? I pulled them out, they're in my hand. So I look at the marbles in my hand, right? A subset of, of what's actually, you know, the whole universe. And I look at that subset and I say, okay, from this, I'm trying to estimate what's going on in the bag. Now we can substitute forest and my hand for a quadrat. It's the same exact thing. Same exact thing, okay? That's statistics. Grab a subsample, infer something about the whole giant population overall. 
Okay. Probability is the same thing, just in reverse. It's the same basic idea. So probability says, hey, given I knew, if I knew everything about that forest, if I counted every single tree in that forest, or in the case of my marble bags, I counted every single marble in the bag, um, and I'm going to grab three marbles in a minute, probability is going to tell me the likelihood that, you know, uh, what the composition would be of those three marbles in my, in my hand. Does that make sense? So same thing, just sort of different, different sides of the same coin. Okay. And so, you know, so, let's, so if we flip a coin, right, you guys pull out a coin, you guys probably don't have any coins because you're all, you're all, you're all iPhone users and, and credit card users and everything. But, but it's, let's, let's do an imaginary trip down uh, fantasy land and assume you guys had coins in your pocket, right? And you pull the coin out of your pocket and you flip it, right? And so um, we might want to ask something. So how many heads, okay, so the question is, is this, is this a regular quarter or is there something, you know, screwed up with this quarter? Intentionally, accidentally, I don't know. So how many coin flips would I need to do to convince myself that this is a, a real coin or really, I could really tell this is a problematic coin, right? Clearly one flip and it comes up heads. That, that doesn't, I can't make a judgment from that, right? That would be the equivalent of you sampling one quadrat from one bean lab, from one bean community, and then trying to tell me something about the bean community, right? At a minimum, we need to do two flips. And in reality, we probably need to do many flips, right? We need to do like, you know, tons and tons of flips. And if, and if on average it was 50% heads, and on average, 50% tails, you know, we said, oh, it's probably cool. But if we did a lot of flips and we found that, you know, 95% of the time it came out as heads, we would probably say, hmm, that's, you know, that, that's weird, right? So the question is, how do we know, um, you know, between those two extremes, when it's totally, obviously, super fake or, or, or flawed or messed up and completely, totally perfect, great, right? Because that's the real world that we live in. That's the real world that we live in, in, in nature and in dealing with conservation challenges, et cetera. So what we do, is this making sense, you guys? All good? Any questions so far? Okay. So this is, this is um, uh, hypothesis testing, right? So in the case of my coin flipping right here, what I'm going to say is um, my null hypothesis, the nu and, and that's written by, by H for hypothesis and the subscript zero, Right? And we pronounce that null, so no, or zero. So null hypothesis is that there's no difference between my two populations, between my two quadrats, between, my, between you know, the sides of my coin. Right? And so, so the null hypothesis is always that, by convention, it's always that there's no difference. Yep, all these things are the same. There's no effect of giving the dog more dog food. There's no effect of giving the cancer patient drug A versus drug B. No difference, no difference. Okay. And then we also always have an alter so-called alternative hypothesis. And this is where people start going wrong, right? This first part probably makes sense. This alternative hypothesis doesn't say that drug A is way better than drug B or that um, uh, forest patch A is super more species rich than forest patch B, all it says is there's a difference. Doesn't say what that difference is, it just says there is a difference. So the null hypothesis, no difference, and the alternative to that is there's some difference, right? We don't care at this point if it's more, if it's less, if it's twice as much, if it's, you know, we just, there, there's some difference there. By convention, how our modern scientific popper and all the, the history of modern science and, and Descartes and all these guys, how, how we've progressed, how we typically progress is that we default to assuming that the null hypothesis is correct. We default to assuming there is no difference between our samples until we have really good evidence that there is something different, that there, there's a difference in there. 
If we find that there is a difference there, then we reject the null hypothesis and we, uh, for the time being, accept the alternative. Does that make sense, how this process works? Questions about that? Sound familiar? Yes, no? Yes, yes. okay, okay. All right. So um, for, for our, our coin example, um, uh, you know, I'm talking about coins, but it's the same thing as, as just about everything you're reading in our, our papers and, and all this kind of stuff. All we're doing there is comparing two, two things, two different types of things, thing one and thing two, right? And when we have a lot of these things, multiple samples, right? We call that a population, right? A sample of a population. And so we're saying, hey, does this group of things differ from this group of things? It could be coin flips, it could be trees, it could be fish, it could be whatever. So here's this gets to making sure we're all on the same page in terms of lab write-ups and things like that. So anytime we measure, let's measure how tall people are in this, in this class, right? So some people are gonna be super tall, some people are gonna be super short, most of us are gonna be kind of in the middle, right? And so, so if we sampled all of us, we'd, we'd find a distribution, right? We're not all the same height, right? We're diverse. And so how do we characterize that, that, that community? Well, we do that in a couple different ways. The two most fundamental ways to describe a population are a measure of where most things are. The term we use is, a, is central tendency. There's many different ways we can express central tendency. The most common is, that if one will default to most cases, is the mean, the mathematical mean. Where we add up everybody's height, person one, person two, person three, person four, person blah, 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 blah. and then we divide by the total number of people that we measured, right? But just remember, there are many different ways to measure central tendency. But the first key thing, when we have a distribution here of and, and, and people understand, uh, to, to be clear, if you guys are on the same page. So this is, let's say this is height, okay? Assume that's height on this axis. And this is how many of us in the, in, the, in the class are that. So we have a few folks that are really tall and a few folks that are really small, but then most of us tend to be, you know, we'll tend to have, uh, most of us will tend to cluster towards the middle, right? Does that make sense? In this case, this is called a normal distribution. There's various distributions populations can take, but, but generally speaking, with many of our natural populations, things tend to follow normal distributions in terms of the biological world, ecological world. Okay, so that's what I'm showing you. So, so a measure of the central tendency in this case would be basically the peak, the middle of the, 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 middle of the distribution, the middle of the peak. And then how noisy it is how close we are to being the same, that's a measure of the spread. How wide is that distribution? Right? We can go, and the general term for that is the dispersion. And we have all different things we can measure that. We can measure standard error, we can measure confidence intervals, there's all kinds of things we can measure, right? The default that we'll tend to use for us, because it's just simple and it's straightforward and it's relatively easy to calculate, we tend to use mean for the central tendency and standard error for the dispersion. But anytime you're making a figure, a presentation, whatever, you are welcome to use whatever you think is most appropriate for that particular setting. So even though this is our default, it's not required. But in most cases, that's probably where you guys should start, especially if you guys aren't really sure what to do. Start with mean and standard error. Okay, so then this is where we get to the, the comparing things. So here, if we're just measured folks in here, we're like, oh, okay, it's how tall we are, check. But if the question is, how tall are students in, you know, Sierra Hall versus students in, I don't know, Aliso Hall, right? Then we'd, we'd need to not just sample us, we need to go sample those folks. So yeah, measure central tendency, measure dispersion, I mentioned that. So, okay, I guess I'll pause for a second there. So, so the, most, the simplest statistical test that we can use on, on something like this is a so-called t-test, named for the, the statistical 
uh, a variable that we use, the t statistic. Okay. So if we talk about um, you know, group of fish A, group of fish B, you know, same thing as group of students in room A and group of students in group B, um, we can compare these things. So let's say we have uh, kelp bass and sand bass. These are both the same genus, different species. Um, you know, common here in our Southern California waters. Uh, sand bass have a huge breeding center in a lot of our sandy areas, such as just off of the city of Ventura and the city of Oxnard, big breeding area. Kelp bass, the most important, the most caught uh, recreational fish species in the Southern California Bite. Super good for fish tacos, by the way. Uh, so kelp bass, sand bass, and the question is, hey, are these, are these fish the, the same, you know, the, the, the same um, size? So we get a bunch of fish and we measure how long they are, let's say, okay? So here's, here, here we have, we have, uh, so we did that and we found out that the kelp bass on average are 181, uh, a little more than 181 centimeters long. Sand bass are on average 214 uh, uh, centimeters, <laughs> that makes sense. I'll say millimeters, okay, uh, let's, let's say millimeters, that sounds a little better. Uh, uh, and, and, and 214 millimeters long on average from our sampling. Okay, then we can calculate standard deviation, which is one measure of dispersion. And the standard deviation for this first one is about, uh, about 50, and the standard deviation for the next one is about 51. So pretty, pretty similar uh, variance. The first one, since we have a lot more kelp bass, we were able to grab 200 individuals to do the measuring. Sand bass, since they're a little more cryptic and they don't aggregate quite the same way, um, we got a lot, but not the same amount. We got 174. We got a slightly smaller size. So the null hypothesis here, if we were saying, hey man, are these fish the same in terms of size? We would, the null hypothesis would be again, right, no difference. Everybody with me? The alternative is that there's some difference. It doesn't say one's bigger than the other. It just says there's, they're not the same. That's all it says, they're not the same. Okay, and we would use something like a t-test to do that. How would we do that? Well, we need to measure them, right? And so, so here we go. This is what we're, visually, this is what we're doing with a, with a t-test. So we're taking one population and we're, we're measuring all the dudes, and we're taking another population, we're measuring all the individuals in that population. And what we're looking at is, you could think of it as the signal to noise ratio, right? So we all want strong signals. We want to be able to hear that radio station really, really well. We don't want a lot of static. We want clear, 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 crisp. So, so we can consider the central tendency, the signal. And we can consider how, how wide the distribution is, the noise. So the wider it is, the harder it is to see that signal is separate from another signal, right? The farther away those, those, those means are, those signals are, the more likely it is that we're gonna see them as clear, distinct thingamajiggers. And so um, we would go through and calculate this stuff, and then from this we would go through and do the whole T statistic. We're not gonna do that right now, but, but, but that's how we would calculate it. And we get some number, and we get some value and it would imp put out a number. And so, so this is what that would look like. So this is same kind of thing. This is now just the distribution of the, of the, the T statistic as opposed to the distribution of the, of the fish lengths, but it's the same idea, right? The same idea. And so um, we, went, we ran through that and we, we got a number of seven something, 7.41, the T statistic. It's really, really far away. Right? So this is, this is under normal circumstances, normal populations, the, if, we, if, we, if we compared two random populations that were the same thing, they would be zero. They would have no difference. Right? If they were exactly 100%, if there was a dude that was six foot one here, and there was a lady that was six foot one over there, and you know, same thing. So, so if that was identical, it would be zero difference. So as things get more and more different, the, t, the, the, the quantity of the measure gets bigger and bigger and bigger, right? And degrees of freedom has to do with how, many, how big our sample size was, right? So that has to do if we sampled two fish or 200 fish. And the more fish we sample, the, 
higher the degrees of freedom, the, the better, uh, the, the more likely we are to see stuff. And so we've, we've now moved into this world of probability. And so we're, we're talking about here likelihood um, uh, on average with, with theoretical populations. And yeah, so we don't have to do that right now. I want to skip this. Um, and so, so essentially what we're doing is we're, is we're is we're turning this into a simple mathematical expression. But, but what I want to focus on today is not, not so much making the, the calculations, but this, the conceptual idea, right? We need to know these things. We need to know these things. We need to know how these, these, these two populations compare to one another. So how we're going to do this in general for our, our you know, default lab experiences, our default exploration of stuff as scientists, is first when we have a two, two groups of things, or more, three, four, five, six groups of things, whatever, right? We can call those years of newspapers. We can call those bean communities. We can call those um, uh, uh, species, grassland uh, uh, species in, in our meadow. We can call those um, invertebrates in the intertidal, whatever it is, right? The first thing you want to do is say, hey, are these things, so the default is that th these things aren't different. They aren't different in terms of abundance. They aren't different in terms of species richness. They aren't different in terms of whatever. And so to, to, to get a sense if that sort of passes the smell test, we first calculate the central tendency. And then we calculate the noise around that. We calculate the variance around that. And then let's visualize it. Most of us can see these things much more clearly when we visualize it. That's why we're graphing stuff. That's why for our lab activities, that's why for our, our, your basic first step when you're exploring things, let, let's visualize it. Even if the first graph is kind of crappy and just quick, quick, quick and dirty, it begins to help us understand uh, how these things relate. And then once we start to have it in visual form, we can start to inspect this. Ah, these 20 bars are about the same. OK, cool. And then these two over here are radically different. Aha, those are probably going to be the ones that differ, right? Or, or, or however your pattern shows itself. And then after that, then you can go forward, if we have time, and do rigorous statistical testing and hypothesis testing quantitatively. But that's the last step. The first step is just visualize it, right? And so a lot of our questions in our lab will be about the visualizing. So here's a bunch of data. Make some sense to it. Organize it. And then I'll ask you guys some questions. Hey, so does this, you know, what, do they look like they're similar? All these guys are the same except for population X. Population X looks really few individuals or something like that. And so here's an example of that. So um, this, is this, these are, this is all the same exact data. The, these are, these are uh, di physical dimensions of parts of the flower. And these are species one, species two, species three. So all the same data, just so average. So the, air, the, the bar is average. And then we're looking at different measures of the variance. So on the left is standard deviation. In the middle is standard error. And on the right is a 95% confidence interval. So does anybody remember what these three, what, what, I mean, not mathematically, but just conceptually? Anybody want to take a stab at trying to remind me what standard deviation is? Yes. Yeah, so, 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 standard deviation is a measure, uh, is is a measure of of this, right? So, standard deviation is a measure of how spread out our data is, and be, just follow some, and, and it assumes is that the distribution is normal and everything. But one standard deviation. Uh, so we actually have one standard deviation, two standard deviation, etc. But one standard deviation is about uh, uh, sixty-seven. It, it, one standard deviation up and down is about uh, a 67 percent, will cover about 67 percent of the data. So don't, don't worry about numbers. So a standard deviation is a measure of how, how wide that is, right? So if, if, this, if this peak was down here 
and, and the data was way spread out, that's going to have a much larger standard de deviation than something that's almost pure, boop, almost everybody's right here, and boop, go down there. That'll have a very small standard deviation. Okay? And that's essentially an expression of the noisiness of the data. Um, standard error is all it is is standard deviation standardized by the sample size. Because it turns out that, that standard deviation is really, really sensitive to how many, if we sampled three individuals or 30 or 300. So standard error is a way to try to, to control for, the, for how, many, how many individuals we have in, the, in, the, in, our, in our measuring. And then confidence interval is basically just taking that standard deviation and applying some assumption about, uh, about the T statistic, about, about the T distribution. But, but that, that, they're similar, but as we go from left to right, it beca they become more and more useful. Uh, left, it's easier for us to get tricked by some just aspects of how we sampled. And as we go to the right, it's, it's, it's easier for us to have greater confidence in what we're seeing is real. The 95% confidence interval is going to essentially, if, again, you can calculate the confidence interval at 90% all kinds of different ways, but, but a default, a common thing would be to look at the 95% confidence interval. The 95% confidence interval would say that 95% of the time, all of the data from this same population, occasionally there's going to be a dude up here, dude down here, but 95% but of the time, the things are going to fall between these two bar, bet between the top bar and the bottom bar. Therefore, if we look at something like, let's say this guy over here on the right, the, this species over here, and this species over here, uh, check it out, this, this, uh, uh, this bar doesn't really overlap this bar, so we have a pretty high confidence that those two populations are statistically significantly different from one another, in this case, based on the size of their, of their flower. So it's a way to visually look for patterns, right? We still would need to go down, if we're writing a paper on this, et cetera, we still need to go down and do the actual real statistical test. But it helps us as we're starting to look through stuff. Um, standard deviation, it, it's not necessarily that way, right? Again, I just told you this is the same underlying data. Um, but it's harder to see that, right? Standard error is, is sort of in between these two things. And standard error is much easier to calculate. So we'll, we'll tend to, by default, use standard error. And usually, if we have approximately the same sample size, if, if uh, this range of this species, this population, and this one don't overlap, there's a pretty good chance that that's statistically significantly different from one another. So Caleb's question is, the larger our sample size, the larger the standard error is? Mm, or the smaller. Or sorry, the, the smaller it is? Um, yeah, kind of, assuming that the population has a relatively uh, norm, a, a similar measurement. It's like right? a normal distribution. But, but if the population is super, super noisy, it's not necessarily going to get smaller. But, but in most cases, yeah. In most cases, the, the more we sample, the smaller the, the errors get, generally speaking, but not always. So I, one of my things for my PhD, I looked at the recruitment of algae, and re algae recruit very, very rarely. So you know, sample like hundreds and hundreds of things to get like you know a couple individuals arrived. So so I had very noisy data. So even though I sampled a lot, you know I would have to sample like tens of thousands of, of plots to get like a really like small um, uh, error bars. But it was true that the more I sampled. The error bars got smaller, but not you wouldn't visually you wouldn't be able to tell they got smaller because the data was so noisy, so, so much error. So for standard error, you usually are going to be using that because it's more likely that you're commonly seeing standard deviation for confidence intervals. Yeah. So pretty much the only time we should use standard deviation is if we're if all we're talking about if we're not doing a hypothesis test. So standard deviation is useful if we're trying to calculate you guys as a population, just just you. So we're not comparing it to anything else. And so, so that tells us how similar we are to one another, how similar our heights are to one another. And so that's where standard deviation is useful. 
But once we start going population one to population two to population three, it, it becomes um, oftentimes hard to, it's not helpful. So standard error will, will help us with that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Other questions? Is this making sense, you guys? So this is why, so this is why our default thing is, again, there's, there's multiple ways to do everything, right? And, and there isn't necessarily one perfect answer. But as, since a lot of us are taking some baby steps here in terms of visualizing our conservation media data and our, and our, our fish populations and all these bean populations, all these things, right? The default should be, hey, here's my, here's my group one, population one, sample one, forest one, whatever the hell it is. And so I'm going to calculate a, an average and then calculate a standard error and put those error bars on it. So without error bars, I have no idea what the hell is going on here. I cannot make any inferences about that or, or can essentially make, in the real world, can't really make any useful inferences about that. For some reason, many of you guys are coming into upper division thinking that all you do is throw up a mean or calculate a mean and that tells you something. That tells you nothing. That's only the first part. That's only the central tendency. We then need to know how noisy it is to know if that's real, right? And as we saw uh, this last week from the Bean Lab, right, some people, because of the way things worked out, we, were, we should have had multiple samples from each thing. Some of our samples, we, did, we only had one sample, right? Only one, one measure of, of richness or evenness or whatever it was, right? And so, you know, it said graph it, so you guys graphed it. But you don't actually know without those error bars on there. You don't, you know, I said by inspection, what, does it look like this, right? But, but really, you don't know if this thing's more diverse, less diverse, without some measure of that noise. So our default thing is gonna be sample a, sample a population, central tendency, how noisy it is. And then we can start to make some, some educated uh, inferences as to, if something's bigger, something's smaller, if things, things are about the same, et cetera. Does that make sense? Questions? Okay. So I'll just say for completeness, I'll just say that um, uh, when, we, when we eventually do go and do rigorous hypothesis testing, we need some measure, right? Because, because some members of our community would say anytime anything one time ever in a million differs, then it's significant. Others would say it has to differ a million times for it to be significant, right? So we need some kind of convention as to what we, what we call, what, where, where, where we call the ball or the strike kind of thing. And so we reject the null hypothesis when something is very unlikely, when, when, when something is very unlikely to get that just due to chance. And so what does that mean? Okay, I just said very unlikely. What the hell does very unlikely mean? By convention, that's the only reason. By convention. Some folks, some old mathematicians in Europe a couple centuries ago just started saying, I don't know. 100% seems like a bit much. 80% doesn't maybe seem like enough. 90% maybe doesn't seem like enough. So, so long story short, we, we, we centered on 95%. So in other words, uh, we will use the criterion that this thing can only happen 5% of the time or less, totally due to chance, as, our, as our, our cutoff. So when we do a hypothesis testing, uh, when we do a hypothesis test, there's different t statistics you can use. Uh, there's there's you know, analysis of variance, t-tests, all these various things. They will all produce some measure of the probability of getting this difference just due to random chance. And that probability due to just random chance is the p is the p value. Which technically speaking should be written as an italicized p. People just get sloppy these days and just write just type the type of p. But p, and so if it's if it's equal to or less than 0.05, and so that's 5% of the time, right? 0.05, then we reject the null hypothesis. And then we, 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 for the time being, accept the alternative hypothesis. That's how we start with. In some cases, we might be looking at the effect of a hurricane on a rare butterfly. 
And so we didn't have time to go sample all the butterflies and maybe some things are hurt and maybe the first responders have a screwed up truck and we can't get there and we can only sample 10 populations or something like that, right? So we might do that this test and we might find P equals 0.07 that these insect populations differ, right? We might, we might make an argument that, well, yeah, statistically it's not statistically significant, but we think biologically or ecologically, you know, 7%, given that we were running around after a hurricane, didn't have all the money, didn't have all the, that maybe is significant. So you can make arguments like that, but, but again, by default, our, our default is P equals 0.05 or, or, or lower is what we use to reject the null hypothesis. Um, and I don't want to spend time talking about statistics so much, uh, the, the statistical tests up here, but suffice to say, t-test, same thing, but t-test is one population to another. What if we wanted to compare multiple, multiple population one to population two to population three to population, treatment one, treatment two, treatment three, treatment four kind of thing? And that is, yeah, I don't need to worry about the commands. And so that is, uh, so that would be an, an analysis of variance and we can go on, go on and, and keep talking about that stuff. Um, in terms of terminology, we're going to talk about uh, terms in, in a second here more broadly, but, but a population is the stuff that we're, that we're looking at, stuff we're investigating, right? Um, a census is what we love to do and we almost never can do in conservation biology. So a census is where we actually, so a population is, is the, the, the subset that we're looking at. Census is when we counted every single individual that exists, right? So in the US, we mostly hear that with our decadal census, right? The, the, the population census, where we go and we measure all the humans in the, in the United States of America every 10 years. And so that's required by the US Constitution so that we know how many taxpayers we have and how many you know, services we need and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, oh, you can't, how come you can't see? Wow, that was weird, you couldn't see census. I wonder why you couldn't see census. Um, uh, so, census so that's what a census is. And then um, a sample is uh, a, a subset of the whole thing, right? So a sample is what we usually are doing. When we, we put the quadrat down and count how many beans here, we're, we're sampling the overall population, right? In 2010, 2020, 2030, um, we would be censusing the U.S. population. Cool? So census would be the ideal thing. We never or almost never have the time, money, or resources to do a complete counting of all the trees in the forest or all the tigers in the, in the, uh, in, in, you know, the Indian subcontinent or something. Okay, so this, so this is what we're talking about. So, so here's our, um, so the population we're talking about, let's say, it are the kelp bass that are at Leo Carrillo State Beach, just offshore at Leo Carrillo State Beach. And um, the thing we might want to be interested in is, is uh, how big these fish are, right? So what we're going to do is we have all these fish, and then we're going to grab a few of them and measure how big they are. That's a sample. Mostly we're dealing with samples of population. And so we're going to take that sample, we're gonna, and we're gonna make some inference graphically, statistically, whatever, about that overall population. And so this is another thing that's come up, and several of you guys made this statement, and it was incorrect in your write-ups this last week, so I wanna make sure we hit on this. So one of the things I said, hey, should we use you know, this or that? Should we use option A or B? And a lot of you guys said, this one's more accurate. That's wrong. Almost everybody that said this wrong. So this is what we mean by accuracy, right? So accuracy means uh, the extent that a particular quantity measured is the reality, is the reality. Um, so free from bias is super perfectly uh, real. Precision is over time when we did the same method, we would get a similar output, right? Ideally, our samples, our, our methodology is both accurate and precise. So we wouldn't want a method that we, that we um, you know, tried it one way on Monday 
and tried it another way on Tuesday and got totally different answers, right? That, that there's something flawed with that methodology. And so this is what, this may be the easiest way to think about accuracy and precision. So let's say we're, we're shooting arrows and we have a target down, down, down the other side of the mall. We have some hay bales put up and we have a, we have a target and we're trying to get to the middle. We're trying to get the bullseye. So I, I shoot a bunch of arrows, Sal shoots a bunch of arrows, a bunch of us shoot a bunch of arrows, and, 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 and then we, did I say errors? Errors, Jesus, man. I got statistics on my brain. We shoot a bunch of arrows, and we're like, choo 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 And so the arrows are shown by the um, yellow dots here, okay, where, where, where they landed on the, on the target. And so look at these guys on the right. So these, wherever they landed after the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, all landed pretty darn close, right? Same thing here. First one landed, and the second one, and, third, and it, pretty close to the, the, the last one is ended up pretty close to the first, the middle one's ending pretty close to the first, right? So we talk about these as having high precision. And like, if, you're, if you're coaching somebody how to shoot you know, arrows, archery, this is the best thing you want. You want high precision. You don't, want, you don't care if they're hitting the bullseye first. You want them to be repeatable. Just like a quarterback throwing a football. You want, whenever he tries to throw it in the spot, you want it to always go that same spot. And then if the spot is wrong, we can get him to adjust where he's thrown it, but, but the idea is it's consistent, 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 right? That's precision. And then, uh, and then the, over here would be, if we did the same thing, but one time, boom, the arrow is kind of close, like this one, oh, sweet you know, in the bullseye, and the next shot, it's off the target, right? So that's low precision. That's not, that, there's no consistency in that person shooting. That's a lot harder to train him or her, right? Because it's like, you know, we've got to start from scratch, as opposed to just a little bit of adjustments here or there. Yeah? Okay. Um, uh, but then what we can talk about is we can talk about, hey, how close are we to the target? Which would be an analogy for how close are we to the actual real height of the trees, or the real um, how many babies mom has, or whatever the thing we're measuring is, right? And so the closeness to the reality is what we would call accuracy, or not. So that's the definition of accuracy and precision. In our write-up uh, last week, some people were saying, I choose this method because it's more accurate. You don't, Based on what you guys were telling me, that, that wasn't the way to say that, right? You didn't, you, you didn't know that. Um, it, richness, evenness, diversity, those are all potentially equally accurate. Um, it's not that one is less accurate and one isn't. You would say how we did the quadrat might be more or less accurate, right? But you need a lot more information to, to judge whether that was accurate or not. Does that make sense? So the analogy is some of you guys were saying like, oh, this value is this. And by looking at that one value, you're telling me if it's accurate or, or precise or not. And to make that argument, you need to, you need to have a, you know, several samples and, and lots of comparison. So, um, so, so be careful with the term, you gotta be careful with the term significance, careful with the term population, careful with the term accuracy, all that kind of stuff, because they all have specific meanings. Um, yeah, okay, cool. Um, I think we'll, We'll, uh, we'll skip this. Okay, so the last thing I just want to mention here to get you guys to think about this, and another reason why we want to make sure we're, we're, we're graphing our data appropriately is, to, is this idea of independence. Fundamental part of how we do science. Fundamental part of how we do conservation. So here this guy went and he, he grabbed a bunch of, uh, of things off the bo bottom, did a trawl, dumped this trawl in his box here, and, uh, and there we go. And so the question is, what's the sampling unit? So what, what, what is the um, chunk that we're measuring? Is it the fish? Is it the trawl? Is it what? It's gonna depend on what our question is. It's gonna depend on what our question is. So for example, here's, a, here's something we can think about. So let's say we wanted to know how mercury impacts fish. And we're worried if there's a contamination from a a chemical plant up the, up the hill or something like that, and we want to know, hey, is this, is this possibly a problem? So we're like, I don't know, let's do an experiment. So the, the power plant people or the government regulators or the town or whoever says, hey, 
can you guys help us with this? We want to know if this mercury is impacting um, our fish. Okay. So here's the experiment we set up. We get a bunch of buckets, okay? And then we're gonna have uh, uh, two treatments. We're gonna have, we're gonna have um, uh, some that have mercury added and the concentration that it's in, in the river, let's say, and some buckets that don't have mercury added. So we're going to get some fish from some clean sites far away. We're not grabbing fish from our river. We're getting fish from elsewhere. OK. So I got 10 buckets there. Um, and I'm going to have five that have mercury added, five that are uh, you know, default water. We have little air hoses in there and stuff so the fish have water. And, um, and we're going to measure, measure how big the fish are now and at some point you know, a week or a month or something that, from now. Cool. So I want you guys to tell me um, what the what what and, we're, and so at some point we're going to go measure all these fish, right? We have we have ten fish in each bucket, okay. So we're going to go measure them, and at the end we're going to have you know fish number one is going to say it's 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 you know ten centimeters long, uh, and it's in it's in uh, bucket number one that had that had uh, uh, you know mercury added. And, and, and then you know, we'll go through and have all the fish measured. So I want you guys to get with your buds right now at your table and figure out what our level, what, what's a replicate here? So um, do we have, so we have 10 fish per bucket, right? Times five buckets each. So, do, so is our sample size, when we calculate, for example, our, our uh, me mean value, is that mean value going to be a mean of 10 fish, 50 fish, what? So firstly, scooch together. Get, so you guys have your tables come together. So you guys say hello, introduce yourselves if you don't know everybody's name at your table. And, uh, and say hi, and let's figure out, if we're making a graph of here, how you would divvy up your fish into, into which groups to, to make sense of this. Ready, set, go. So there's a total of 100 fish. Total of 100 fish. So you guys talk about it as a group. Talk about it as a group. So the question we're asking is, this, does mercury affect growth of the fish? That's the question. You don't know yet. Does this concentration of mercury affect the growth of the fish? You don't know that. Right, so we grab the amount of mercury that's in the river. So we don't know. So you're, you're gonna make a figure, you're gonna take the, you're gonna sample all these guys, so just measured them at time one and at time two, and you looked at the difference, so they grew two centimeters or whatever it is, right? And so the question is, how do I look at, at um, whether mercury was, how do I visualize whether mercury had an impact or not? Keep talking, keep talking, keep talking. <laughs> 
So everybody must have their answers, because you guys, you guys, okay, so let me hear, let me hear some of the ideas you guys have. How about you guys in the back? What did your group decide? So, so you're thinking you're making two bars. Okay, so you, so, let me turn this off. So you're thinking we'll have two bars. It's, it's no mercury or mercury added, is that right? And so this would be mercury, okay? Okay, okay, so, so, so you think we, we have some, we calculate some bars, and the sample size here would be 50, and the sample size would be 50 here. Okay, you guys agree? Uh, sure, okay, yeah, right, yeah, sorry, this, I should have wrote, this is growth yeah. in, in centimeters or whatever, okay. You guys agree? Uh, we thought that there would be um, a bar for non-treatment and a bar for treatment. Okay, okay. Each treatment. Uh, so what about each treatment? Um, there would be a bar for non-treatment versus treatment. So, so non-treatment, treatment, okay. Okay, so okay, okay, so good. So, so you're thinking we're gonna have a bar for each of yes. the buckets. Yes. Aha. So you guys are thinking that we'll have no, so this is one option. Another option is that we'll have uh, like one, two, three, four, five, and one, two, three, four, five, right? Uh, with and, this, and these are all these are all no uh, mercury added. These are all mercury added. Is that what you guys are saying? Okay. And then and then okay, good. And what about you guys? What are you guys thinking? We have a similar idea from the one on the bottom. This one? Okay, so so far we have three groups thinking this one. Okay. Eddie, what did you, what did you guys group say? Um I, I believe we ended up on the second option. With, with this oh, one? Oh, no, 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 the first one. This one. Yeah, but funny enough, I'm doing capstone, sea urchin, something similar, and we're doing kind of like second graph type. That's ah, what we've been interested Okay, and wait, 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 last table. Oh, we said the, the bottom graph. Bottom graph, okay. Yeah. So it turns out this is not how to do it. Totally get it. it so it seems to make sense, right? You're like, dude, you measure all the mercury, dude, put all those fuckers in that, right? But that's not how we do it. <laughs> Okay, but, but here's the important reason why, right? Why? Why is this one a better approach than this? The bottom one is like a mean of all of them, whereas the top one shows you the mean of like each individual bucket, which gives you a bigger sample. So you're getting close. You're getting close. Yes. You're, you're getting closer. So you want to help out? Yeah. If you had, well, not thinking on the terms of like variance and stuff, if you had, you can better see the. It's not about, yeah, but it's, it's, yes, but it's not about better, easier to see. So this is, let me see if I have a thing here. I don't have a thing, okay. So, so here's the deal. Um, you guys, 
so okay, so so if we did all these guys here, and we said, ah, I'm going to show, and I'd say this is very, very common. You guys, you guys, I, I'm not trying to trick you, but the notion that almost everybody said this, many, many, many of you guys go down this route, right? And so that's why I'm asking this question, right? I don't want you to go down this route, right? Do not do that. Don't get tricked, okay? And so here's here's the problem with this. Here's the problem with this. I have a bucket, yeah. I have a bucket. I have a bucket for my experiment. This bucket is the universe. This bucket is the universe. So if I wanted to know, let me let me let me step back and ask a question. Okay. So if I, how tall are humans? How tall are humans? In in twenty twenty three. What if we went? What if we went? And we measured everybody at Channel Islands. Problem with that? As our measure of what how, how tall humans are? Yes. Yeah. Probably not as what? Say it's out. Say more. Uh, people could be absent in a non-genosphere. Ah, so there's some people that have shitty nutrition. They can't grow as fast. There's some people that are coming from communities that are taller statured or smaller statured, right? But all we sampled was here. So it turns out you and I, even though I might seem like I'm tall or something, we are much more likely to be, like just, just the fact that you and I are in the same room, we're much more likely to be the same. If we go to some of the Kurdish villages where I work, they, those people are small. And every person I bump into is small. So just the fact that I'm there, those folks are more like each other in terms of height than, than, some rant, than, than a person on the CSUCI campus. You would be the outlier. So, yeah, and I am, I'm always the outlier. <laughs> uh, so the point is, the, the hundred of us or the thousand of us that we sample here at Channel Islands, we're not independent from one another. Even though we think we're all different and somebody's screwed, we're, we are much more alike than we are different compared to a, a Kurdish village. Same thing compared to a, a Papua New Guinea community, right? Or um, a community in northern Siberia, right? So the point is, I just sampled all of us, 30 of us, or I just sampled all thousand of us at CSUCI. And it sounds like a thousand people. That's a good sample size. And fuck, that's better than two. But, but we're not independent from one another. What we want when we're sampling, what we want, what we want, what we want with this. Shit, you shit, can't see because it's light. What we want with this is, is I want to make sure my sampling is independent. So when I grab these fish, I only have time to measure 20 fish, let's say, right? When I grab these, these 20 fish, I don't want to get the big ass fucking fish. I want to get, I'm going to be as likely to grab the big fish as I am to grab the medium sized fish as the baby fish. So I used to have a project in, in Mexico where we were looking at this, this uh, fish that changed sex. And it's very popular, spear fishing to get these fish. And very popular fish, uh, very popular uh, targeted fish. And we're worried, um, it was it being overexploited and everything. So I went down with all these uh, macho spear fishermen. And they're like, yeah, we'll help you. And they all wanted to shoot the big fish. Because they're like, man, right? So I was like, well, fuck, I guess I'll shoot the other ones, right? Because I wasn't much of a man. Uh, but, but it turns out it was much harder to shoot the little fish, right? They're harder to hit. And it turns out we found out there were, some of them have a, were golden colored. So most are like brown and kind of brown and spotty. But some of the, not all, but like a subset of them were golden, but only when they were small. So if we only, if we only, if, if we didn't have random sampling, we, we wouldn't have found that some of these are, have a golden morph. And so, so when we sample, inherent in our, Whatever it is, your capstone project, you guys are doing an internship project or something, whatever it is, 
when we're, when we're looking at that bag of marbles and I put my hand in, I don't want to be pulling out the biggest marble or the roughest one that sticks in my hand. I have to have a sampling method that's equally likely to get the big ones, the small ones, the, the fat ones, the short ones, the, the, the slickery ones, the, 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 the jagged ones, all that, right? Otherwise, it's not a representative sample. So that's representation and this idea of independence. I want to make sure that when we sample something, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, not biasing. So, so, so how that comes into play here, here is um, maybe these tanks were next to the window in the lab. These two tanks here, maybe. And maybe over here is next to the air conditioner or something where it's colder. I, mean, I, I don't know. It, there's a million possible things we can invent, right? So by looking at the, the warm hot fish to the cold dark fish, um, maybe that's influencing how, how much they grew, right? So I'm not entirely sure. So it turns out what the sampling frame here would be is the bucket, is the bucket. Because these, these 10 fish in here are experiencing the same environment, right? Or let me do it a different way. Maybe I was coming in, I was like, what? I just watched the Super Bowl, like, what? And I was watching the Super Bowl in the lab, I was eating the lab, and I was eating the lab. And I had some guacamole, I'm like, what? And I clapped in some guacamole blue and fell into a couple of these buckets, right? Maybe that is better food for some of these guys. So they're like, what? I'm a jam on my, my avocados, right? And so, so again, these individuals are experiencing the same environment where we're contained. They are, they are a group. Right? These guys may or may not be. So this is this idea of independence. What is independent from one another? And so when we have a, a system like this where we're doing an experimental manipulation, there could be something that we've accidentally introduced in, in, the, in the doings of the experiment that causes issues. So it's much better to do this. It's much better to do this. And then, to calculate a mean of the means, which is called a grand mean. And that's actually the best way. So the point is, we should pay attention to stuff. So just because, just because we're looking, we want to look at the HG plus the no HG, that's not what you just grab. You don't just randomly grab that, not randomly, I know it's not randomly apply that, but it, it, we need to think about how the data is structured. We need to think about how we sample those items. Uh, yes, yes. If we only have one group of 50 and one group of 50, then you could do that. Because mm -hmm. they wouldn't be independent from one another. Um, an another way would be like if we grabbed, if we grabbed uh, 20 fish from River A and 20 fish from River B and 20 fish from River and we split them each, each time in half. Right, so we were maybe trying to count for genetic differences or something, right? So just like, hey, what is what is the effect of mercury? Right, this would be another example of how we'd have this same type of setup. I gave you the example of us potentially introducing things from experimental design. There could also be the populations we're bringing into this. Also, the point is we just want to think about this, and, and so when we're doing our lab write-ups. Just because it says whatever, you know, year this or or Dr. A said this transit, think about it, right? So I want you guys to think about this stuff. Before we go and graph this stuff, okay, first, let me see. If I have all this stuff together, chill, cool. And then I want to put this together, okay. Then I calculate the, the central tendency of everybody or of these, of these sampling frames or, you know, what? Okay, that, okay that, that, this is, the, this is the, um, the structure of the sampling. So I'm going to do those, and I'm going to add my variance on there, right? And so have a look. And so, so here's a key thing. I didn't, I didn't graph this. I should have graphed this. But check it out. As we saw, um, uh, the, generally speaking, the more we sample, the, the smaller the error bars get, assuming that they're, they're normally distributed. But here's the deal, though. So this, here's, so this mean is here. And the variance is calculated out of a sample of 50. So there's 50, essentially 50 little dots here that we're going to go 
to calculate this from, and the, and, the, and the error maybe won't change, I mean the mean maybe won't change, but the variance might change, it's gonna get small. This guy, right, now, so this is n of 50, these bars are only an n of 10 each, right? So the, it's gonna be a lot noisier. And then when we take the grand mean of the means, that's gonna be an n of five, right? So the error bars are gonna to tend to go up higher. Mathematically, there's some tricks we can do. We're, we're not gonna go into that now, but suffice it to say, how we do this mathematically is I would like to do this. I would like to do 50 versus 50, right? That's a, that's a large sample size, as opposed to 10, right? But mathematically, this is what we do. Or it's me, not mathematically. Statistically, this is what we do. We say, hey, is there any effect of individual bucket? And we do a hypothesis test saying, no hypothesis. There's no difference in bucketness. Doesn't bucket is no effect on the growth thing. The bucketness of the mercury free dudes. And if we found no effective bucket, and then we go over here and we test to see if there's an effective bucket, no effective bucket, and an effective bucket in this case would be testing bucket A, B, C, D, E, right? So we, we test those. And if there was no difference, we accept the null hypothesis, no difference. And then we go over here, and this is F, G, H, I, J. And we go over here, and we go, uh, yo, any difference between these guys? No difference there. Then, period, end, stop the analysis, go to a new thing, then we can pool all of these together. Because then we can say statistically there was no effect of bucket, and then we can go down to here. So you might be able to do this, but you don't start there. And certainly in your initial lab right at kind of first pass, you don't start there. But we try to always you know, get to the, the, the larger sample size if we can. So if you were pulling up like a lab report, would you want it to be obviously the first the graph on top? Yeah. And then you would also want to graph like down the bottom. Uh, maybe. maybe. For, for purpose in our class, mostly just the top graph. Cool. So we're mostly not going to get hardcore into, into really intense hypothesis testing. We're mostly looking at, because we're trying to cover a lot of stuff in this intro class. If you guys are doing capstone with me or something, we would go do that, more of that kind of stuff. Um, or if you guys are coming to New Orleans with me or something like that, we do more of that kind of stuff. But, but, um, but for this purposes, we're doing a bunch of sam we're going to a bunch of things across the semester and doing endangered species here and that. So we, we just don't have time to go into that much depth in most cases. So basically, if I said, hey, show me something, you want to show the, the, the first step, the first pass, smell test kind of level. Cool? Make sense? OK. Um, is that all I want to say about that? OK, so just to summarize real quick, I'll just say that uh, um, we talked about statistics and probability. We talked about um, statistics allowing us to test hypotheses, right? Um, and that the key thing for us, first pass, is going to be tell me about these populations. Tell me about the, the central tendency. Tell me about the spread of them. Cool? OK. Um,